14. Eat sugar and see what happens. By the early 1960s, I had decided that there was enough evidence from epidemiology to suggest that sugar might be one of the causes of coronary disease. The time had arrived, therefore, to begin to do some experiments to see what effects were produced by sugar in the diet. Since it seemed that the large increase in sugar consumption in Western countries was accompanied by a decrease in starch consumption to about the same extent, we fed our rats and some other animals in the laboratory with diets that contained all the protein, fat, carbohydrate, vitamins, and mineral salts that they needed, but varied the relative amount of starch and sugar in the carbohydrate part of their diets. Mostly, the carbohydrate consisted either entirely of starch or entirely of sugar. Sometimes it was a mixture of the two in a predetermined proportion. I should say that similar experiments were being carried out in other laboratories, notably by Professor Aharon Cohen of Jerusalem, who was, however, looking into the possible role of dietary sugar in producing diabetes rather than heart disease. In our experiments with human volunteers, we asked them to record in detail the food and drink they took for a period of two weeks or more, with every item accurately weighed or measured and written down at the time it was being consumed. They were then asked to increase the sugar they took, more sugar in tea and coffee and on their breakfast cereal, and more jam, confectionery, and other sugar items while at the same time reducing the amount of starchy foods, such as bread and potatoes. By the time they were due to change, we had calculated the amounts of all the elements of their ordinary diets during the preliminary period, and could now give them advice about how to make the change while maintaining the same total intake as before of carbohydrate, protein, fat, and other substances. This, of course, was not absolutely precise, because we did not want to interfere with their normal lives more than we had to. But since they went on weighing and measuring their food, we knew whether and how much they had deviated from the new diet. After two or three weeks on the high-sugar diet, they went back to their usual diet, while continuing to weigh and measure their intake for a further two or three weeks. In our first laboratory experiment, we looked to see what sugar did in rats to the qualities of fatty substances, such as cholesterol and triglyceride in the blood. We found that the amount of triglyceride in the blood was enormously and rapidly increased when rats ate sugar. The amount of cholesterol, on the other hand, did not change. Moreover, switching the diets resulted in very rapid change in the amount of triglyceride, which not only increased on the change from starch to sugar, but decreased again as sugar gave way to starch. It later appeared, mostly through the research of other workers, that rats make and dispose of cholesterol quite differently from the way in which human beings deal with it. In other species, however, sugar was found to produce an increase in the amount of cholesterol, sometimes a considerable increase as well as an increase in triglyceride. This occurs in baboons, chicks, pigs and rabbits. In the spiny mouse, a desert animal, feeding with sugar produces such a considerable rise in cholesterol in the blood, and to a lesser extent in triglyceride, that these fatty materials give the blood a distinctly milky appearance. Moreover, while the liver of the rat becomes enlarged by some 25%, the liver of the spiny mouse increases to twice its normal size when the diet contains sugar. In addition to the experiments on rats with normal diets, we have also used diets containing abnormal types of fats. By adding very saturated fats instead of the unsaturated fat that we usually use, and by adding a large amount of cholesterol to the diet too, we have produced much higher levels of cholesterol and triglyceride. When we then substituted sugar for starch in these diets, there was a still greater rise in cholesterol and triglyceride. Sugar produces many changes in rats beside the increases in cholesterol and triglyceride.
I do not know how many and which of these will be found to be related to changes concerned with the development of atherosclerosis and coronary disease in humans, but I shall mention a few of the effects of sugar that at present seem to be linked to these conditions. I shall discuss still other changes later on in connection with other conditions in people. Many research workers have studied the mechanisms by which the body makes and stores fat. The idea is that factors affecting these mechanisms may have something to do with the fatty materials that constitute atheroma. Along these lines, our studies included the measurement of some of the enzymes that are concerned in fat synthesis and storage. Our first measurements were of an enzyme in the liver called pyruvate kinase. This enzyme is important in the production of fat in the body from a variety of substances derived from the diet. An increase in activity is taken as a measure of the fat-forming activity of the liver, the major site of fat synthesis. Young rats given sugar in the diet showed, after ten days, five times as much enzyme activity as did rats without sugar. We also measured the activity of an enzyme complex called fatty acid synthetase, which is closer to fat synthesis than is pyruvate kinase. It exists especially in the liver and in the fat tissue, adipose tissue. In the liver, an increased activity implies greater production of fat, which is then carried in the bloodstream. In adipose tissue, an increased activity implies a greater removal of fat from the blood for storage. With a sugar diet instead of a starch diet for 30 days, rats developed twice as much synthetase activity in the liver and one-third as much in the adipose tissue. A rise in the liver and a fall in the adipose tissue suggests that more fat was put into the bloodstream by the liver. Nevertheless, there was no compensatory increase in the enzyme that would be responsible for storing this in the adipose tissue. There was, on the contrary, a decrease in this enzyme. We believe we have an explanation for this to do with the fact that the hormone insulin is involved in converting the glucose part of sugar into fat, but is not involved in converting fructose into fat. This now gets into very complicated biochemistry, so I shall merely say that this is an example of the complex actions of sugar that I shall talk more about in Chapter 19. The changes in enzyme activity that result from adding or subtracting sugar in the diet occur very quickly. In less than 24 hours you can detect the difference. And if you then change the diets over again... The process is reversed once more in less than 24 hours. I mentioned earlier that coronary disease in man is associated with a number of features other than the levels of fatty substances in the blood. So we looked for some of these features in our sugar-fed rats. The effects include an increase in blood pressure, a deterioration of the body's efficiency in dealing with high levels of blood glucose, a change in the properties of the blood platelets, and a change in the level of insulin in the blood. Rats fed high-sugar diets for a few months show all these features. Given a dose of glucose on an empty stomach, rats on a normal diet show a moderate rise in the blood level of glucose, which rapidly returns to fasting level. Rats kept on a high-sugar diet show a higher fasting level of blood glucose a greater increase after the glucose dose, and a longer time before the level falls to fasting level. I shall have more to say about this behaviour of glucose, reduced glucose tolerance, when I discuss sugar and diabetes. One cubic millimetre of blood contains about 250,000 of the small bodies called platelets, about 5.5 million red blood corpuscles, and about 7,500 white blood corpuscles. If one cubic millimetre is an unfamiliar measurement, you can convert it into a more familiar unit by multiplying it by a thousand 
to get the approximate numbers in one cubic centimeter. This figure, multiplied by 5,000, gives approximate numbers in the whole body of an adult man. The blood platelets are very much involved in the process of blood clotting. This is a highly complex process in which an important early step, or perhaps the very first step, is a change in the properties of the platelets. They become more sticky so that they can stick more readily to the walls of the arteries. They also clump together more readily. These and other changes are common in people with severe atherosclerosis or coronary disease. We tested the platelets of our sugar-fed rats and found that they clumped together, aggregated, distinctly more easily than did the platelets of the rats fed without sugar. The behaviour of platelets is another matter that I shall bring up again later on. I am increasingly inclined to believe that the clue to coronary diseases lies in a disturbance of the hormones of the body. This is why I think it important that Professor A. M. Cohen and others have shown that sugar-fed rats develop abnormalities in the way that the pancreas produces insulin. My colleagues and I have found, in addition, that sugar-fed rats also develop enlarged adrenal glands. We have not been successful in producing atheroma in our rats because the strain of animals we use is resistant to the disease, but other workers have been able to do so. In Paris, Dr. L. Chevillard and his co-workers reported that rats develop atheroma of the main blood vessel, the aorta, when sugar is included in the diet. Although atheroma did not develop in our rats, we analysed the aorta to see if there was any difference in the fatty substances within the walls of this artery. We found substantially more cholesterol and triglyceride in the aortas of rats eating the sugar diet than in those eating the starch diet. We also looked at the effect of adding saturated fat or unsaturated fat to the diet and found that it made no difference to the fatty substances in the aortic tissue. I have been talking so far about our experiments with rats, since most of the experiments carried out by ourselves and by others on the effects of sucrose were done with these animals. However, some experiments with other animals have also been done. Rabbits fed sugar have been shown by us and by other research workers to develop a raised level of cholesterol. In cockerels and in pigs, we ourselves found that sugar increased the level of triglyceride. Our pigs also developed a high level of insulin in the blood. Cockerels of the Rhode Island Light Sussex strain developed quite definite atheroma of the aorta with sugar, but not with starch. In a second experiment with white leghorn cockerels, we measured the area of their aortas that was affected by fatty deposits. It came to 46% of the aortas in the chickens fed with sugar and less than 1% in the chickens fed with no sugar. What about human subjects? Professor Ian MacDonald of Guy's Hospital in London carried out many experiments with people who were given, mostly for a few days, mixtures of food components with and without sugar. Briefly, he found that in young men, sugar raises the level of cholesterol in the blood and especially raises the level of triglycerides. This does not happen with young women. It does happen in older women, however, after menopause. Professor A. M. Cohen of Jerusalem has done experiments which, for the most part, were conducted over longer periods than those of Professor MacDonald, and his subjects were eating normal foods rather than mixtures of pure food items. They were given diets in which the carbohydrates were either mostly starch in the form of foods like bread or mostly sugar. Professor Cohen and his co-workers found that the sugar diet produced a rise in cholesterol level and also an impairment in glucose tolerance, 
By now it has been well established in several laboratories that sugar in the diet results in an increase in cholesterol and triglyceride in the blood of human subjects. Our own experiments have mostly involved the careful measurement of the usual diets of young men, then getting them to replace part of the starch with sugar, while making as few other changes as possible. We carried out extensive examinations on these men while they were on their normal diet, again at the end of two or three weeks on the high-sugar diet, and then two weeks after they had gone back to their ordinary diet. In our first experiments with 19 young men, the sugar-rich diet produced an increase in blood triglyceride in all of them after two weeks. In addition, six of them showed other changes. They put on about five pounds in weight, the level of insulin in the blood rose, and there was an increase in the stickiness of the platelets. All of these changes disappeared entirely, or almost entirely, two weeks after the men went back to their usual diet. Three aspects of these results we found especially interesting. The first was the fact that about a quarter or a third of our subjects showed this special sensitivity to sugar, while the remainder did not. This suggested to us the idea that only a proportion of men are susceptible to coronary thrombosis through eating sugar. Secondly, the rise in the level of insulin recalled to us that there had been two or three British research workers who had suggested that a raised level of insulin could be a key factor in the production of atherosclerosis. Thirdly, we were intrigued that the men who were susceptible to sugar, as shown by the rise in insulin, also put on a lot of weight while on sugar and lost it within two weeks of going back to their normal diet. This reminded us of the association between overweight and liability to coronary thrombosis. Indeed, it has been argued that, if eating sugar does increase the risk of heart attacks, this is only an indirect effect, since dietary sugar predisposes people to become overweight, and it is being overweight that predisposes to the disease. We tested this suggestion by getting some young men to overfeed by increasing either the sugar in their diet or the starch. With the sugar, there was an increase in the concentration of both triglyceride and cholesterol in the blood, with starch giving the same number of additional calories. There was no change in the concentration of either of these fatty substances. Nevertheless, Excess weight does increase the risk of developing heart disease. Moreover, many overweight people show some of the characteristics of the disease, including high blood pressure, increased glucose and insulin in the blood, and insensitivity of the tissues to the action of insulin. One of the common features of people who are liable to have coronary disease is a raised blood pressure. Among the very few investigations that have been made to see if the blood pressure is raised when sugar is included in the diet was a study by Dr. Richard Ahrens from the United States, who worked in my laboratory for a year. He was able to demonstrate a small but definite increase of blood pressure in rats taking sugar. Later, he carried out a similar experiment with young men who were given diets containing varying amounts of sugar. They showed a rise in blood pressure proportional to the quantity of sugar in the diet. In reviewing the subject of sugar and heart disease, Dr. Ahrens wrote that the epidemic of coronary heart disease continues to increase on a worldwide scale in rough proportion to the increase of sucrose consumption, but not in proportion with saturated fat intake. Our suggestion that only some people get atherosclerosis from eating a lot of sugar led us also to suggest that there should be a difference between middle-aged men who have the disease and those who do not. People with the disease should include those who experience an increase in insulin from eating sugar, and there should therefore exist a relationship between the amount of sugar they eat and the level of insulin.
Those who by middle age have no sign at all of atherosclerosis will include those who are not susceptible to sugar, so that there should be no relationship between their sugar intake and the level of insulin. We tested this hypothesis on two groups, each consisting of 27 middle-aged men. One was a group of patients with peripheral vascular disease, and the other a group of men with no symptoms who were coming to a clinic for a regular checkup. The results, plotted on a diagram, confirmed our prediction. On the whole, those patients who ate more sugar had higher insulin levels than those who ate less sugar. Among the normal people, those who ate more sugar had the same levels as those who ate less. A second sugar-feeding experiment with 23 men produced several of the same results, but also some additional features. Once again, after two weeks on the high-sugar diet, all of the men showed a rise in triglyceride, and six of them a rise in insulin and platelet stickiness. This time, however, all the men also showed a distinct rise in blood cholesterol and an improvement in glucose tolerance. I shall have more to say later about this effect on glucose tolerance. Curiously enough, these additional results were not caused by a higher sugar intake in this experiment compared with the last. In fact, the average daily sugar intake was 300 grams, compared with an intake of 440 grams in the first experiment. We believe that the fact that we do not always find a particular change when we give a high-sugar diet, for example, no increase in cholesterol levels in our first experiment, but an increase in our second experiment, is due to the tremendous interaction of the changes produced by sugar and the ability of the body to counteract some of these changes by adaptation of its metabolic processes. This view will be further discussed later. We asked those volunteers who had shown the rise in insulin and the other associated changes to help us with some additional experiments. In one of these experiments, we gave three of these men a high-sugar diet once more and examined more closely the effects on the platelets. We also did the same with three of our volunteers in whom sugar had not produced a rise in insulin. We compared, that is, potential hyperinsulin people with control people. What we did this time was to look at the behaviour of the platelets when they were suspended in blood plasma and subjected to a high electrical potential. This procedure, called electrophoresis, causes the platelets to move toward the positive pole at a particular speed. When a very small quantity of a substance called Adenosine diphosphate, ADP, is added, they move slightly faster. When one adds more ADP, the platelets move distinctly faster. At least, this is what happens with blood platelets from normal individuals. But platelet behavior differs among people with a variety of disease conditions, the most notable of which is atherosclerosis. Here, the platelets move much faster in the electrical field with the low concentration of ADP and more slowly again when the concentration of ADP is increased. You will understand, then, that we were interested to see what a sugar diet does to platelets both of people in whom it produces an increase in insulin and of people in whom it does not. We found the answer quite quickly. When they were taking their usual diets, the platelets of the three hyperinsulin men and of the three control men behaved normally. However, after ten days on the high-sugar diet, the platelets of the hyperinsulin men took on the behavior of people with atherosclerosis, while the platelets of the control people did not change. A week after the high-sugar diet, the behavior of the platelets of the hyperinsulin men began to revert to normal. Another experiment with our hyperinsulin volunteers was conducted to see whether a hormone produced by the adrenal glands was affected as well as insulin.
we asked eleven of them once more to go on a high-sugar diet. Before they did so, and two weeks after they had begun, we measured both insulin and a hormone from the adrenal gland related to cortisone. We found that the insulin level in fasting blood increased by about 40% after two weeks on the high-sugar diet. The level of the adrenal hormone, however, increased very much more, to between 300 and 400% of the original value. This observation recalls our finding that sugar produces an enlargement of the adrenal glands in rats. We ended our research report by suggesting that these results could be used to screen people for their sensitivity to sucrose, or, as we said, to identify those people that were sucrose-sensitive. If a short period on a high-sugar diet produces a rise in insulin or adrenal hormone, we shall know that the subjects are in danger of developing coronary disease from eating too much sugar. If a high-sugar diet does not affect these hormones, then we shall know that sugar will not give them coronary disease, although, of course, it might still produce other ill effects. Unfortunately, we have been so busy with other research that we have not been able to pursue this idea, nor has anyone else done so. About six years after we published the results of these experiments, they were confirmed by Dr. Sheldon Reiser and his colleagues from the Nutrition Laboratory of the United States Department of Agriculture in Beltsville, near Washington, D.C. For three weeks, they gave women as well as men diets with either sugar or starch, switching the diets for the following three weeks. On the sugar diet, the men, more than the women, showed an increase in blood triglyceride, cholesterol and glucose. But what was even more interesting to us was that the American workers confirmed our observation that a proportion of the subjects, a quarter or so, were especially sensitive to sugar, showing also an increase in the insulin concentration of the blood. In some of their experiments, they were able to show that normal quantities of sugar, about equal to the average American intake, was enough to produce these effects. Let me here insert a small anecdote. Sometime after Dr. Reiser published the results of his research, I had a telephone call from an American medical journalist. He asked whether I had heard of Dr. Reiser's report, and if so, did I think it was a breakthrough? I said that I thought it was indeed important, but that my own opinion might be biased, because Dr. Rice's publication was a confirmation of our own work. However, because it was not new, it could hardly be called a breakthrough. But didn't I agree, insisted the journalist, that it was at least an American breakthrough? Our view, then, is that the underlying cause of coronary disease is a disturbance of hormonal balance. Apart from increased insulin and adrenal hormone, for example, many patients show an increase in estrogen. We have only recently been measuring the concentration of this hormone in the blood of some of our volunteers. This was in some young men taking a diet in which they reduced their sugar intake from an average of about 150 grams a day to about 55 grams. After three weeks, the concentration of estrogen fell from 11.5 units to 8.4 units. They then resumed their habitual diet, and after two weeks, their estrogen concentration had risen again to 11.1 .1 units.